about the development of kid picks and some other things. And I'm going to kind of go way, you know, way back. And the version of kid picks that I will be talking about is the original, uh, you know, series of versions, or versions, <laughs> not the one uh, that is, you know, sold today. Uh, and so. Uh, Many of you may have never have never seen that one, or some of you I know kind of grew up with it, and that's that's kind of the one you uh, re you remember. And if all goes well, I'm actually going to uh, uh, run the original one. I have to have a special computer to do it because it won't run on modern computers, and it's got uh, you know it runs in 8-bit graphics and uh, 640 by 480 uh, uh, dimensions. I mean it. So so I just keep one computer around just to be able to run it. Uh, but I also wanted to just uh, talk about kind of my own uh, development, and uh, I'm not a, uh, I've, I've basically never taken a, uh, a programming class, you know, I'm just sort of like, I just have done all of this uh, by kind of pure interest and, and, and determination. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, that when I, you know, kind of came in, I kind of, it kind of flashed in my mind was that Kid Picks was one of the very last uh, Kind of garage type, you know, pieces of software that kind of made it big, uh, you know, because the development costs were so high that that for actually regular kind of you know computers, it cost it was cost prohibitive. Well, um, with uh, mobile, that all has just changed, and now we're back at that uh, at that, that point. And I think this, uh, in some ways, it's very appropriate to have this in this location because I, you know, there are so many. Uh, you know, really great projects that are going on that now that are being done by, uh, you know, one, two, three people, small groups, uh, and again, just by kind of sheer determination. So, well, um, to start with, I, uh, uh, I started out in, in photography. I still do photography. Actually, I still have two lives. I, at the University of Oregon, I teach photography classes, and I teach, uh, you know, kind of computer, uh, uh, you know, digital arts classes also. Here I did Polaroid pictures of uh, kind of these set up things, in this case a bathtub with donuts around it and newspaper uh, floating and, and whatnot. The donut in the far corner there, uh, it had, uh, uh, remember, it had just fallen in the water actually. I put it back up, I figured no one would notice it. Um, but um, one day uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, I forget, about 1973, my life kind of changed. I was working at the Evergreen State College as a photographer, and uh, I was walking down the hallway, and I heard this clattering coming from this room, and it was full of these teletype machines. And I saw a friend of mine in there, and he was a photographer also, and he was kind of doing something on this machine. I asked him what he was doing. He said he was programming. And uh, I said, well, what's that? And he showed me a couple lines of like, you know, basic, you know, you know basic language, uh, you know, how it was done. And it was like love at first sight. I just knew I had to do this, where you could write these instructions and then this machine would do whatever, whatever you told it. So uh, I didn't find a tutorial book. I just found a book of the commands, the basic commands. And so I just started to go through the book writing little programs that used each of the commands. And uh, all of the things I did were kind of absurd, almost kind of conceptual art uh, projects. Uh, uh, you know, being a photographer and, you know, you're always getting your work kind of rejected and stuff, so I, you can't read this very well here, but at any rate, this was uh, uh, like a humorous um, uh, gallery rejection letter someone might uh, uh, put together. And, and it picks from several different random possibilities and writes this letter, that, you know, um, uh, uh, to, uh, um, you know, kind of tell you that you didn't get the show. But all of my projects were like kind of these just silly things. Uh, when I, I left that job for a while, went to Portland, and we ended up starting uh, 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 several friends, uh, uh, start, started the, a gallery called Blue Sky Gallery. And on top is the original uh, Blue Sky Gallery. It was a little tiny hole in the wall. I think our rent was $75 a month or something. Uh, we ran it off of a little donation jar at the door. Uh, but one of the people in the gallery was a very good graphic designer. And since, uh, and I kind of knew the, the, about this printer in town that was like a wholesale printer. And so we got these, every month we produced these really beautiful posters. 
And uh, we also got a hold of a mailing list when people knew someone at this uh, really high-end gallery in New York. And so we sent the, the, the posters out all over the country. And, uh, and we didn't mean to deceive anyone, but we projected this image that we were this big gallery. People were shocked when they came in and saw this little hole in the wall. Uh, Blue Sky is still going to the day, this day. This is what it looks like. That's what it looked like in April. Now it has its own, uh, you know, really, you know, beautiful space, and it's uh, one of the original uh, alternative, uh, uh, you know, kind of arts organization spaces. So, uh, but when uh, uh, I went to graduate school, moved to Seattle, got got married. My wife Kay is right there in the audience. Uh, uh, a professor of mine said he just bought a computer. He got an Apple II, and he just had just come out, and you could own your own computer. And it's like this old craving came back. Uh, and I ended up getting a computer. I got an Atari 400. Uh, at, the, at, uh, at that time, it was uh, the, one of the least expensive computers you could buy, but it was still a lot of money, actually, even by today's standards. But uh, and so I started to program on it, and I just loved it. Uh, I kind of, again, that kind of obsession uh, uh, kind of uh, caught me. And I didn't just love, like, the programming. I loved learning about the concepts, and I started finding out about user interface and, and interactivity. Um, because at that time, there was just kind of, I think it was basically kind of starting up uh, for most people, that kind of interest in making uh, a, 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 a user experience that was satisfying. And so, uh, uh, again, I wrote a lot of programs that did a lot of kind of funny things, and then I decided I needed to do something practical. So I actually got an electronics made simple book and uh, did some kind of minimal research and figured out how to have the computer control my enlarger and turn the lights off in the dark room and also time things. And uh, this was a little program I wrote that uh, it would, if we're developing film. But one of the things that I, boy, it doesn't look very good up there. One of the things that I uh, found myself spending a lot of time doing was going at, through and counting pixels and figuring out how to make something big in order to make something as clear as possible and, and as understandable as possible. Uh, that, uh, that I found that immensely satisfying. You know, you can kind of try this and try this and try this uh, and, uh, and make something really, uh, really uh, clear. Now we're going to kind of jump into another little parallel uh, uh, project at the same time, which are these artist books. Uh, again, my interest in kind of the uh, publication, uh, design, and uh, but the books themselves were, of course, kind of again these kind of art art things that are not something you would actually read. Uh, this is a page from one called a, a book called Dry Reading, which was done at the same time I was working on Kitpix, and you might even recognize some of the uh, effects that. Uh, if I can get the cursor over there in the other window, well, I guess it's not going to go. At any rate, um, there's the drippy paint, right? That house has drippy paint. And so this was actually done before Kid Picks, even the original one came out, uh, uh, kind of you know, working with those kinds of ideas. And there's, here's a more recent uh, book, uh, uh, Mars Observations, in which I uh, do various things with the text in the background. Then I use a computer to manipulate the text, uh, modify it, or look for patterns and whatnot. And uh, this one, actually, I used a program I wrote, which I'm going to show you later, called D minus, which is a reverse spelling checker. Uh, here's one in which all the words have the word uh, uh, bed embedded in it. So. Now, as I mentioned, I have been um, uh, doing a fair amount of research uh, in user interface. And I read a, a couple things, and these kind of, uh, and, and it's funny, this one quote from this Byte magazine, I had, had to kind of go back and find it. It kind of stuck in my head, and it seems like a really simple thing, but it, it kind of kept coming up. It was an article from, uh, what was this, 1984, 85? Um, it was an article on, you know, user interface, and it was an article called Walt Disney and User uh, Oriented Software by Paul Heckel. It was things you could learn from Disney about software. And, uh, you know, and it, he had several points, but the one that I kept, kept again, coming back, and this seems obvious, but it's a, 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 a make it interesting. A character never simply walked from one place to another too dull. 
He might be angry uh, and, and show it in the way he walks. He might drag something along. He might scratch his head. But he would do some piece of business that was in character, advance, uh, and it would advance the story, and was interesting. And so, uh, you know, one of the things I did in Kid Picks is I just tried to make everything interesting. You know, I didn't, nothing was sort of there, nothing was just along for the ride. Uh, and of course, it can't be interesting in some way that doesn't make any sense at all. And as it says here, it kind of needs to lead to, uh, to, to a certain end. Uh, and uh, I guess one of, the, one of my favorite ones now that I, that I see every now and then on the, on the Macintosh is when you like uh, put in the wrong password and the little dialog box shakes like no. You know, I mean, that's, it's that kind of thing where it's actually uh, useful, but also just kind of wonderful. It, uh, you know, almost makes you happy that you put in the wrong password. Um, Alan Kay uh, also, he, uh, well, he wrote an article in the Scientific American uh, article on software, and he, it's actually just full of wonderful quotes, but it starts out, computers are, uh, to computing as instruments are to music. Software is the score whose interpretation amplifies our reach and lifts our spirit. Um, and, uh, you know, he goes on to talk about how, uh, you know, like the, it, it's really the architecture that is the important thing. It's the design of the program, it's the user interface that, uh, that is the important thing. Um, well, then the Macintosh came out, and uh, I decided to, you know, you know, switch computers, get one of those. We took out a, a loan uh, and uh, bought one. Here's the original first issue of Macworld magazine. And uh, it, was, uh, it was wonderful. And one of the great things about the Macintosh was it wasn't just sort of like a, just a computer program. There was all this other kind of stuff about user interface, about user, you know, satisfaction. And so the, the, the two books that, uh, you know, that I would read was Inside Macintosh, which was this, originally, it was like one book and it was like a phone book that thick. It was all about all the, you know, the programming kinds of, you know, that the, they called in the toolbox. And the other one was the Macintosh Human Interface Guidelines, where they went through and, you know, kind of gave specific rules about interaction that all programs should use. And of course, a lot of this was borrowed from the Xerox, work at Xerox Park, but for the most part, uh, the software that people used, uh, uh, like uh, every single program sort of invented its own, you know, user interface, its own rules. And so every time you learned a new piece of software, you had to learn, you know, kind of the, the whole universe of things. Well, the Macintosh provided all of uh, this uh, stuff for you, like pull down menus and, and the way, you know, text works. And so no programmer in the right mind would then go and write their own routines. And it forced everyone to kind of do things in a standardized fashion, which is good for the, uh, for the user. And so that was really fascinating to me. And so I got the, uh, I got the Macintosh and started learning, uh, teaching myself to program. And at that time, we programmed it in Pascal. So I learned Pascal. I wrote uh, little desk accessories that did kind of funny little things. But the one program that was actually kind of had, had some success with was this one called the, was an interactive simulated, uh, uh, you know, like camera. And so, uh, as, boy, that is uh, weird up there. Getting his moray pattern. Just, just ignore the moray pattern. And it's not there. Uh, the, uh, but these are interactive controls, and so it, it demonstrated the relationship in real, in, in real time between f-stop shutter speed, film speed, uh, and uh, it, worked, it worked pretty well. And I put it out in the public domain, and, uh, and uh, I was at a SIG, SIGGRAPH conference, uh, and I went to the Macintosh uh, users group once, and we all went around and introduced ourselves, and afterwards somebody came up and said, you, did you write camera? And it was sort of like, uh, you know, it was like he thought I was someone, someone special or something. And so I, I thought, hey, this is all right, I kind of like this, because uh, uh, it had kind of you know, disseminated. Uh, I have an updated version of this, which, I'll, which we'll look at in a little bit. Now, paint programs. Um, uh, paint programs uh, had, you know, been around since the early, you know, eight, you know, eight-bit you know, computers. But uh, I really love this picture. This is a picture of Ivan Sutherland using a, uh, you know, program and, you know, device called Sketchpad. 
from 1963. This video of, there's an interview with him and, and, it, and, and it shows him using it on YouTube and it's fascinating to see in 1963 uh, that he's explaining what he's doing here. This is really actually more of a vector program than a, you know, than a peak program, but still, uh, uh, it's, it's just amazing to see how this is you know, obviously way ahead of its time, or at least it's, it's the beginning of it. Uh, but, uh, that. And then the Macintosh itself came with MacPaint, and MacPaint was a wonderful, uh, you know, little you know, kind of paint program, and it was uh, written by Bill Atkinson with the user interface designed by Susan Kerr uh, in 1984. And I think that arguably that that screen, even I mean, even minus the picture that's you know that's been drawn there, but but just the just the layout and look of the screen is the most beautiful piece of. <laughs> Of, uh, you know, it's the most beautiful computer screen ever made. Uh, it, uh, it's just, it's just, a, it's just a wonderful thing, uh, big paint. Well, um, uh, one day uh, I was using uh, uh, Kid Picks and Ben, who was three at the time, uh, came in the room and, and he you know, asked what I was doing, and I told him what I was doing, and and uh, put him on my lap, and he started using uh, uh, MacPaint. And I was surprised how quickly he took to the mouse and everything, you know, I mean, it was just, it was, uh, it was really kind of very, uh, uh, you know, it just, he was very good at it. However, uh, there were times when like, uh, he would pull down a desk accessory or, or just do something that you couldn't get out of without being able to read. Uh, uh, and so, it kind of dawned on me, ah, oh, here's my next project. I'll make a paint program that, first of all, doesn't have any dead ends. No matter what happens, you can keep going. You're not going to pull down any dialog boxes or, give you, you know, so uh, it, it will be a little less frustrating. There's a picture of the two of us at that time. He's changed a little bit. <laughs> um, and so I went to work writing the original, uh, this was the original version that was, I gave away free. It, it didn't have sounds. It would, and, oh, and it only worked on the old nine inch screen Macintosh, black and white screen, because the color one was not, color Macintosh was not out. Uh, but that was true of McPaint also. And I, you know, I, I had to figure out how all those drawing tools work. There's no place that I found that was published how you would do it, you know, and some of them like lines are relatively easy, but other ones are, a little bit harder, uh, you know, like the paint bucket, but I kind of figured it all out uh, and, uh, and made it work. Now, uh, since I was interested in user interface at that time, uh, I decided, well, for one thing, since no one knew about this and no one cared about this, uh, I could do whatever I wanted, and I could be just as rigid as I wanted uh, as far as kind of defining things. Uh, and in a few cases, I actually decided I would violate the Macintosh user uh, guidelines because, it, you know, it was appropriate to do it, I thought. So I'm going to read a, a, just a few of the uh, kind of principles that I uh, decided to apply to this. First of all is the prime directive, I call it. The program should be extremely easy to use. No manual should be needed, and the program features should explain themselves through use. All tasks should be able to be performed in the simplest, most straightforward way. The program should go, uh, should go out of its way to meet the user. I tried to have everything happen with just one motion, you know, like not a, not a double motion. Then two, as long as the prime directive is not violated, every opportunity should be uh, uh, taken to make the program surprising and satisfying to use. No opportunity should be missed. The process of making a picture should be as important as the picture produced. That's kind of an important thing that the, uh, you know, that, uh, um, the, you know, the making of the picture is really the important part, that when it's done, it might be printed out and the parents put it up on the refrigerator or something, but to the, you know, the, 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 the kid making it, it's the process that is the important thing. Hence, you can add all kinds of things into the program, uh, like at the end, uh, in the next version, there were like sounds and all kinds of things, um, or an an animated tools that really do not change the picture itself, but uh, just make it fun to use. Um, uh, and then, and then uh, also, the program should in some way expand the concept of what computer per, uh, paint programs are, as well as what mark making can be. At that time, the paint programs I felt were, uh, you know, felt very self-conscious. 
they were really trying to be, I mean, like the names they would pick would be like, you know, they would refer to uh, Renaissance artists and, uh, you know, they, uh, and obviously they were not, you couldn't, you know, especially then, you know, would not look like a real paint. And so uh, some of the tools I made are actually to kind of poke fun at that idea. And there are lots of things the computer can do. And so why not have it, have it do that? So that's, that's the source of some of the kind of the, the, the jokes uh, in it. So, uh, and the program should be open-ended. In other words, things like pre-made graphics, like all the little like, um, like the stamps that you, you use, there's a little stamp editor so you can go in and change them. So. Um, there were some other things too, uh, but uh, I think that's probably, uh, those are the uh, Im important ones, so. Oh, there's another. another uh, <laughs> that's, that's when you try to use a trackpad. <laughs> now, as it turned out, a few months ago, I was uh, informed of this, that someone, a fellow named James Friend in Australia, uh, and, and we'll see, oops, if this, wait a minute. Um, I, I get this link to work, oops. Uh, at any rate, it looks like I'm gonna have to do it for that other screen. Is my cursor there? Maybe it'll work if I click here. There we go. Oh, it's on the wrong here. Let me move this window. Uh, it's running in a browser. There we go. This is actually running on the web. <laughs> and it's an emulated Macintosh from that period. And he used KitPix as one of the actual programs. So uh, it's actually running the original code of the original one. And this isn't like he rewrote it. Um, uh, and uh, so if you actually want to get myself coordinated here. Okay. You can actually use the real thing. So, um, so we've got the tool that draws regular old lines. Uh, you know, we got a tool that draws straight lines. Now, one of the things that, uh, that, that was done at that time is that if you wanted to have a bunch of options, you would put a bunch of options in a menu. Well, for the target user, for kid picks, menus were hard to use. And so I went with this system, and I think it's now called kind of context aware, where when you change the tool, it changes the uh, options down here. So you get 14 different options. So that way the program can have a whole lot of possibilities, but at uh, any given time, the screen is still very simple. I also spent a lot of time counting pixels, trying to make sure that everything was, you know, I was maximizing everything. Um, and then here's the, here's the one where it's uh, more like, a, uh, well, I'll show you when we get to the regular color kit picks, but, you know, this is like drawing on a napkin. This is one of my ones kind of making fun of of paint, other paint programs. Here's one that won't draw a straight line. Mm -hmm. And uh, on, I mean, there are a bunch of them. Here's where you can get the, uh, you know, whatever that is. Uh, and then here, yeah, here's the dripping paint. So. Now, here's something where I, I, have to, I have to thank myself, be proud of myself, thinking of this, that um, at the time I wrote this, computers weren't very fast, and so the paint dripped at a certain would drip at a certain speed. But I knew that computers in the future would be faster, and so I actually went to the work of putting in little timing things that looked at the system clock to make it so that the paint would still drip to this day at the same rate. And uh, I know that that the uh, some of the conversions that were done for Windows specifically. Uh, oops, I think they did something bad. There, is that better? Are you okay? There, I'm sorry. I, I told them I wouldn't get too flamboyant. But there, I, went, I got it. Um, so, but some of the Windows versions wouldn't do that. So as soon as computers got faster, there was no animation. It was just the paint just appeared. So, 
Um, and then, and then uh, undo is a very important thing, and in the, at that time it was only, you know, in a menu. But I moved it out and I made the undo guy right here. And so the undo guy undoes stuff. So. At any rate, that is available and anybody can, uh, you know, can, can use it on the web, which I think is, is pretty nice. So, you now I need to get back to my, uh, get back to, you know, there we go. That worked. Okay, now, uh, I was giving this away, and at that time there was, people didn't really use the internet, but it was on bulletin board services. Uh, and a friend of mine who was department head was really bothered that I wasn't selling it. He thought that I could, you know, that it should be sold. And, he, and, you know, I was happy. I thought it was, it was a nice thing to get for free, and people were happy. Uh, but then just to get him off my back, uh, the Color Macintosh had just come out, and, uh, I figured it'd be a good, good reason to get one. And I said, okay, I'll make a color version and I'll charge for it. And so I just made up a date and, uh, and put a little notice in this version. And, uh, and, uh, um, and as it turned out, I thought I was gonna, it was gonna take several months to convert to color, uh, but as it turned out, it was really easy. It took like a day to figure it out. So I had plenty of time for other stuff. Um, and uh, this was it. Now, obviously, uh, I did not uh, have uh, uh, ben, uh, Ben's uh, skill as a graphic designer <laughs> that time. <laughs> That's pretty ugly. But uh, at any rate, uh, this is the manual, and there's that same picture. Even though I said it, it wouldn't need a manual, didn't I? But people want a manual, so this one had a manual. And uh, there, it actually came on two floppy disks, but one disk was the system disk. You know, I mean, this is... Pretty, this is the old days. Uh, the computer itself didn't have the operating system in it. You had to put a floppy disk in. So, uh, so there it is. And it looked like this. So, and uh, I was selling these for $25. And it was kind of fun to go out to the mailbox and, and uh, find these checks. Uh, $25, that was fun. Uh, and I think I ended up selling exactly 100 of them. Uh, but. Uh, a friend of mine, actually a couple of friends, were actually, you know, helping me trying to find a publisher. And I didn't have any great hope for that. I mean, you know, sort of that kind of thing doesn't happen to me. I have to do everything myself. And, uh, but one day, I got, the phone rang, I got a call from Broderbund. Now, uh, Broderbund, uh, at that time, uh, couldn't have been a better publisher. And they called me up and said, we want to publish it. That they had, a copy had actually gotten to them, and it was kind of amazing. Now, uh, as it turns out, it's kind of a funny story. This is, uh, these are the, uh, 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 the uh, people who started Broderbund, uh, Doug, uh, 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 Kathy, and Gary um, uh, um, um, Carlson. And uh, the company actually started in Eugene, where I live. <laughs> Although at the time they had years before they had moved out and down to uh, down to the Bay Area, uh, actually, and I found out the crown is actually the three of them. It represents the three of them. But at that time, uh, they were their big products were Carmen San Diego and Print Shop. So, um, uh, but it was great, and we went to work on uh, you know taking the version I had and getting one ready to uh, publish. Now, I thought, I thought the, the program I was selling was pretty stable, pretty good, you know. Well, they have a, uh, a quality assurance department that is there, you know, and it's this, you know, this room full of people, and their job is to find problems with what you did. And so my first bug report, here I am working full time, teaching, come home, yet my first bug report is 30 pages long. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so I sort of had, went to work fixing all those things. Uh, but there, uh, you know, being, being kind of a professional outfit, uh, they do things like, they don't just say, oh, the program crashes. They give you the exact steps to go through to make the problem happen. And typically, halfway through reading that, it's like, oh, yeah, I know what that is. So um, uh, it, it wasn't that bad. And so um, we uh, were to work on the, you know, getting it going, and 
I'm sorry, this is so tiny. It, it's the only copy I have of it that, uh, unknown to me, and this is before the program was released, Broderbund had been talking with uh, uh, this fellow, Philip Higabanier uh, at, at Apple, who loved the program, and it ended up being featured in the keynote speech at Macworld, and this time John Scully was uh, you know, head of Apple. And I mean, it could not have been a better place. I mean, ev I mean everybody who did Macintosh software to be featured uh, in this you know, little period in the keynote at Macworld was the ultimate. And so uh, uh, that happened. And uh, I I'm glad I didn't know what happened at the time because I would have just have been uh, terribly stressed worrying about it crashing, you know, in front of the world. But no, but it did fine. And the uh, next, uh, next issue of uh, Mac Week magazine, it was the big magazine, the headline was Kid Picks Upstages Scully. Uh, um, this is actually a picture made at the uh, party when it, was, uh, when it was released. And uh, this is Leslie Wilson. And I guess one of the things I would like to say about, you know, like, making something successful was that I think Broderbund was very conscious of what I could do and what I couldn't do and and uh, and even though it was stressful of kind of making things work out okay now Leslie was the product manager and she was fantastic we would spend you know you know I mean hours on the phone talking about details uh, you know every uh, like every other day and she had just graduated from art school and I think Kidpix was actually a, a program that, that, that he kind of gave her to kind of get started on, too. Broderbund did not expect that it was going to be a, a big thing like it, it ended up being. Uh, this is uh, Rebecca Knievel, who also was uh, uh, one of the main people at uh, Broderbund working on the project. Uh, um, kind of coincidentally, uh, she had been a student of mine at the University of Oregon. I didn't know where, a couple years earlier, and I didn't know where she was. And, and I uh, walked in the door, and there she was. There is Ben and, uh, and uh, uh, Megan, uh, Rebecca's uh, uh, daughter. And so Kidpix came out, and that's the, that's the box. I still somewhere have a box, a shrink wrap box of version 1.0. 1.0 didn't last very long, because within a week they discovered bugs that had to be fixed. And, and so I do have it. And when it came out, um, it received really uh, uh, very good reviews, but this is my favorite review. This is uh, David Pogue, who is now famous, you know, probably, you know, I'm David Pogue from uh, his Nova and his columns in the New York Times and whatnot. But, you know, this is the review. Uh, pros, Kidfix 1.0, pros, brilliant, hilarious, innovative, ex inexpensive, cons, none. And then he ends it by saying the programmer Craig Kickman originally wrote kit books for his son who loved McPaint but kept launching desk accessories and bringing up dialog boxes by mistake. For a while, it was a shareware offering and, and it's finally been picked up and polished to a shine by Broderbund. Dear Mr. Hickman, you have created a masterpiece. Thank you for your imagination, whimsy, and attention to detail. Now write us a word process. So, uh, yeah. And that year, it ended up winning the Software Publishers Association's award for the best user interface of any program of the year. So uh, this obviously <laughs> is not at all what I expected. Uh, it was uh, you know, quite wonderful. Uh, but again, I have to say that that interaction between you know, kind of what, well, what I could do and what Broderbund could do was, uh, I mean, it was a, a really good match. And they were just you know, fantastic people to work for, uh, you know, very, very trustworthy. Uh, first, one of the first things they told me is get a lawyer, you know. Uh, oh, here's another picture of, of Ben. And, uh, okay, now, oh, so there, yeah, there it is. So, um, now, one of the things that I had added to the KidPix Professional was sound. So, let me, there we go. Yeah, was uh, these uh, tool sounds. And, uh, and that was fun. And uh, uh, now, of course, I had my own sounds, but then Broderbud had a whole sound department. So they kind of redid them in a more, much more professional manner. Uh, so we still have the same tools, you know, the lines, the, you know, different types of... of uh, I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, okay. Well, yeah, these are 
these are the ones that mainly have the, mainly have the sounds. Oops, that one is, I don't know what's going on with that one. They all have sounds. Okay. Well, on and on there, the middle magnet. So maybe some of you recognize this from uh, your youth. Okay. And then, uh, well, let's see. Here we go. Okay. And then more. I mean, there are just lots and lots of them here. Uh, now, one of the most popular tools was uh, in the erasers. If you want to get rid of the whole screen, it's the... Wow. It's, That was one of the more popular tools. However, uh, it was not universally loved. Uh, there was a petition by some teachers to have it removed. Uh, and it also, and actually, the version in uh, Ireland that at the time they changed it to a Jack in the Box because uh, you know it was kind of a little too close to home. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, so that's that. And uh, not with these wacky brushes. Here's the. Fractal. You know. I looked up in a book somewhere about you know some, how do you program a fractal fractal tree and uh, make it bigger if you hold down the keys and then so yeah. See, modern computers actually are so fast that they you can see it draw. I, I, that was okay. Well, and then just more of these. Uh, Okay, well, yeah, then, yeah, I mean, dice, why not be able to draw with dice? And these are actual, I mean, I'm using the random number generator, so you could actually use it for, you know, kind of a game if you wanted. There are at least pseudo-random, as uh, well as a computer can do. Mixer effects affect the whole screen, um, and so on. Uh, oops. It was just kind of just everything I could think of, you know. I, I can remember just, you know, leaving the house, going somewhere in the car, and then just having something dawn on me or see something. I can make a, I could make a tool out of that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, paint bucket, typical paint bucket. Yeah, and then different ways of erasing, and then uh, there's a, there's the question mark. Uh, well, well, wait, let me get these. You know, there's just other ways of erasing the picture. All the different ways you're going to erase a picture. Again, this makes no difference in the final picture, but it, it can add to the actual satisfaction of the uh, experience. And then uh, this one actually is a backwards eraser. As you, uh, instead of erasing uh, a picture, you get a picture. Uh, uh, yeah, and just trying to come up with, you know, whatever, yeah, uh, whatever. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I won't go through all these. Uh, okay. Now the type, I didn't want to use, uh, I decided in, in this version to not use the keyboard, but actually to have the type kind of be a stamp. Because that's easier for kids to, to use. Now, uh, now, now originally when I sent it, the, well, the professional version, I used my family is uh, was a saying uh, the uh, letters of the alphabet. But, uh, I would just use the, you know, microphone in front of the computer and the people in the sound uh, department that just was not uh, good enough, so. Actually, one of the people in the sound department was Tom Reddick, who played uh, the original Timmy and Lassie. So, uh, and then the, uh, and then the rubber stamps, uh, which were popular. Hold down, an, you know, hold down a key and you get a bigger one, or hold down another key. Uh, and these were very popular. Again, there's a little controversy here because a lot of people felt that you shouldn't actually, uh, you know, you know, have pre-made graphics. But kids love things like stickers and whatnot, so why not? But this is where if you double, uh, you can, well, you can, uh, you can edit 
the stamp. There's a little stamp editor and you can change it uh, to be whatever you want or you can restore the other one. So again, I wanted to make it open-ended. Now, the um, since I am not good at this kind of thing, uh, I needed to get the graphics somewhere. Well, the original Macintosh shipped with a font called Cairo, which I love. Little pictures, little kind of almost hieroglyphic things that Susan Kerr did. And by this time, I guess Apple was trying to get uh, into the, you know, into the enterprise. And they actually removed the font, and I always loved it. So I figured, well, I'll put it back. Uh, and uh, I met Susan at some point, and I kind of mentioned that I had used the font, you know. And, and, but she, I think she was very happy that I had, had done that because it's really delight, a delightful uh, thing. Although it's, I guess, not really a font in this case. Just you know, stamp things. Uh, okay, undo guy. Now the color thing is probably I didn't do the make the right decision here. What I did is I figured what the smallest rectangle that Ben could hit reliably, and then I figured how much room I had left. And then, and that's how many colors the program displayed, even though it could do 256 or 256 here. But, you know, again, I can, I, I felt like this is my thing. I can do it any way I want. If people don't like it, then let them do their own program. That I was going to go for simplicity and straightforwardness. Um, and so that's that. So now there are many other uh, things that it does. Oh, also, uh, uh, you know, K. Uh, is a you know speaks uh, you know Spanish. He taught Spanish, and so uh, I made a, a Spanish mode, which was switched to Spanish. And I think it, when I uh, at Broderbund they they thought that was a real marginal feature. Uh, I mean, but it was in there, so we go ahead with it. Well, as it turned out, it ended up being a big deal feature in schools. So, uh, so at any rate, there's all you know all kinds of other things, but that is the uh, original uh, kit picks. So do we have any questions? Yes. What's your inspiration day to day? Oh, for day to day? Oh. I suppose just walking around is, yeah. And, uh, you know, looking at things and, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you switch kit picks into Spanish, did it change the sound effects to the letters? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, it did. Uh, there is there's some other problems uh, that were, you know, uh, were not fixed in the first version but later on. But for instance, Enya, the N, you know, is a different, is another letter considered a different letter of the alphabet. And so that had to be added and some, you know, things moved around. Yeah, yeah it did change. Right back here. Yeah. Do you consider yourself a photographer, an inventor, or a computer programmer? Well, you know, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I guess all of those things, or it depends on the day, you know? So, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah? What did the switcheroo do? There's a menu on Tiptix 2. Oh, that was, it, it just would, uh, would, would switch things. Well, it, it, uh, for instance, uh, like if uh, they, or they were adding more sense, of, more sense of stamps, things like that, it would actually kind of load in another bunch of those. Uh, uh, I think it would also to go to, did they go to little kids mode? The little kids mode actually uh, would um, uh, make it so you really couldn't get to the best accessories. But it allowed you to kind of switch things in and out in order to expand the amount of, uh, you know, data. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that you were going to do a your, your favorite process was for software is not really wireframe or do much sketching. Sketching you do a lot of it actually in, in the development environment. Do you think that that has an effect on the final product? Yeah, you know, you know, and that is something that just would not work if you're working with other people. You know, but I just kind of sit down, get an idea, sit down, start programming, uh, and yeah, it, you know, it's. I think it definitely changes the outcome. Uh, whether that's the best method or not, I don't. You know, probably uh, probably isn't. I, I actually always did start with some kind of sketching, you know, but once I got started, it was just all programming, try this, try this, uh, and uh, yeah, because, I mean, I mean, today, if you're working with programmers, I mean, they're program designers and somebody, and they're, you know, programmers, everything's kind of specialized, so everything has to be organized. Uh, yeah. How many units of uh, 
kid pics were sold over the years? Track of that? You know, that's that's a good question. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't, uh, I don't, probably shouldn't get into it, but uh, uh, I wonder that myself. <laughs> but, uh, publishers were not necessarily, I mean, Broderbund was fantastic. You know, and, the, and the people that- Did you that, get a percentage of sales? Yeah. And the people that have it now, you know, here, in, 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 in between, uh, uh, um, well, I, won't, I, I, I don't want to get into it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think a lot were sold, yes. Mm. Uh, you mentioned that you were designing the software, you, you were very concerned with not what you will draw at the end, how you will have the end, Process of what you're drawing. Yeah. Would you, would you single this out as the main reason for the success? Probably. Yeah. 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 Probably. Yeah. When you had the original idea for Kickbits, you were a programmer <coughs> yourself, so you were able to act upon that and do it yourself. Yeah. Would you have any advice for someone who doesn't have the technical know-how but still has a creative, simple idea like that? Uh, I'd say just have a good relationship, a good, a, a, you know, a, a good communication with a programmer, yeah. yeah. The person that does it, yeah, you could certainly do that. I mean, that's, um, that's the way it's normally done. But I think you have to have somebody that is, has a similar kind of aesthetic, maybe, or at least a, an attitude and kind of understands. But yeah, you know, I think you just the right person. For it. Yeah. From a business perspective, would you have done anything differently as far as you know, because obviously you weren't a business major or a designer. Yeah. Did you have done anything differently as far as, you know, you said at one point, well, I was advising a lawyer. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, Business-wise, would you have changed anything? Well, you know, in retrospect, sure, I, there are things that I would have had in that original contract uh, that, that would, you know, wouldn't have made any difference for, uh, until 25 years later, you know, that kind of thing. But, but for the most part, I think, uh, at, the, at least in the beginning, uh, I wouldn't really change too much. I mean, they were they were great, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but as they say, the contract is only really as, as good as the, you know as the person who is the people who are signing it. Good question. I'm, I'm going to retire. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm always working on things. I kind of work on the physical computing things a, a fair amount now with that. And then, uh, I don't know. I wouldn't mind. It would be fun to do, a, a, you know, like an iPad thing. So that's on my list. It doesn't seem to quite ever make it up to the top of doing that, you know, that programming. Where are you based? Uh, Eugene, Oregon. What are your thoughts on innovation? Is it the process, experimentation? What do you think? What's that? I'm sorry? What are your thoughts on innovation? Is it, is it the process? Is it experimentation? Oh, innovation? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I can only say you know, what it, it was for me. Uh, and um, it is, uh, well, for me, it was being able to, since I could program it myself, I mean, it's like I, I could have an idea and I could immediately realize it. And, and I didn't have, and also because no one cared what I did, I could do anything I wanted. I think that was really free. Uh, yeah, it, I think, so I guess part of it is, yeah, just, just go ahead and, and, you know, and do it. And that doesn't mean it's going to work out or people are going to like it, but it's more likely you're going to come up with something more innovative. Uh, yeah. When you start a brand new program, do you start by uh, drawing the interface first, or do you actually just start coding first? I, I'll, I'll draw the interface first, usually, yeah. So you'll draw the picture and then program to the picture of it? Yeah, yeah, that's where I, I get started, because then there's just, you know, you, you've got you to gotta kind of have that basic interface before you can start, you know, programming, because you've got to have some place to make something happen uh, when, when you do start experimenting. 
No, I think that's interesting because I, I find that a lot of people that have taught themselves to program mm -hmm. do that first because they're more visual as opposed to people that learn the program mm -hmm. who start with algorithms first. Right. And yeah. I find the people that actually start with the interface first are actually better programmers. No. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you first started to program, you were very much like a creative photographer type person. And so, do you, how was that like marrying those two things later on down the line with, with um, like all the programs you designed? Did you know that they would come together so well, or did you see it almost as two separate passions at first? You mean the photography and the, the program and programming? Yeah. Uh, no, no, they were completely separate actually, uh, and uh, and even now, you know, they kind of come together, but also. There's no kind of, you know, like in my, my studio, I've got one side that's kind of the photo side, the other side the electronic side. Um, but it, they're a lot closer now than before, yeah. And I, I don't make a big distinction. You know, I know that the students that I have in the digital arts program, uh, when they take my uh, programming for artists class, and it's the same students who take my image, digital imaging class. So for them, and it's really wonderful. It's like they're doing both things. There isn't that big divide anymore. So. Yeah. What ways do you think current visual design software can be improved? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. Um, well, I use Photoshop a lot, and and I think it's interesting uh, that you know it is a, such an old program. Actually, when I got that Software Publishers Association Award for 1991. I think it's 1992, it actually was, you know, happened at the next table, people next to me was the Photoshop people. But, um, you know, it's it's actually kind of kind of uh, kludgy, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, you know sometimes it's modal, it does word things. Uh, you know, so some, I, I would certainly think something nicer can be done. I mean, there's Lightroom, but that's kind of a whole, whole different thing. I don't know. Uh, it's so stable now, I can't even imagine things changing that much. You know, it's like, everybody knows the Adobe stuff, and you know, nobody wants to, I don't want to change it either, actually, in some ways, because I, I know how it works. But, um, yeah, sure. Can we take one more question? Mm -hmm. So you didn't ask the question? Did you have one back then? Yeah. Go, go ahead. Oh, can you describe the process for user testing? Were you doing that on a computer with family or with... Oh, well, for KidPix, yeah, actually, well, the user testing was, uh, first of all, Ben was on my lap, he would try it, and poor Ben, he would have trouble with something, and I'd, and I'd you know, make a mental note, oh, I can fix that, and so he'd come back the next day, well, he'd learned that other way, and then I changed it to make it easier, you know, um, and then uh, one day I took it to a preschool, I got a bunch of computers, took it to preschool, and man, did I ever learn a lot with that user testing. I mean, it's like things that I would never think of. Uh, uh, so that was a big thing. And then, of course, Broder Button had a whole other way. But, uh, but yeah, there's nothing like having people use it. Like one of the things that was interesting that, you know, like that when you click the mouse, uh, that goes into the event queue, and all those clicks do, you know? Well, you know, Ben would use the computer enough that he would click once. Well, actually, other kids were just clicking like crazy. And so all those were being remembered, and the whole program came to a halt because then all those things had, you know, and it's like, it's easy to fix, but uh, that, that kind of, uh, you know, testing. You have to have other people use your software. One of the things that I have found in teaching is uh, that, uh, that uh, people will write stuff. And, and you know, it, it's very easy to write something where you can give the demo, and you can make it look so great if you hand that to someone else and have them use it, it's like a whole other thing. It's like, you know, you realize that uh, you're not, you know, not even halfway there yet with the user interface, so. So where did you find that digital prototypes worked for you instead of things like paper prototypes or alternative methods and testing interfaces? Uh, yeah, yeah. Of course, in my case, I just, you know, program it and, yeah. So, so that rapid iteration process helps you? Mm -hmm. Thank you.